think about our minds. How often do our minds pin us down? How often do our minds overwhelm us with negative information? Human mind is the most dangerous battlefield you'll ever be on. This is Jason Redmond. He's a former Navy SEAL who made national headlines when he miraculously survived an ambush in Iraq. We estimate the firefight was about 40 minutes. I was shot in the face probably in the first five minutes of the firefight. You know, 25 to 30 minutes of laying there bleeding out, waiting very patiently, (laughs) uh, because what else are you going to do? Poor plan violently executed is significantly better than a perfect plan that never happens. And I'll tell you what, as a guy who is laying there facing death, you should know who you are because in the darkest times, it's what will keep you on course. That will be your compass. It will be your light in the darkness to get off that axe and drive forward. big part of your story is that you were severely wounded in Iraq back in 2007. I mean, I'm curious what happened and and more importantly, what went wrong to cause you to be so terribly injured in the field of battle? (laughs) Well, what what went wrong is I got on the wrong end of a machine gun. So, and unfortunately that is part of the job. I mean, obviously things have gone wrong when that occurs. And and Um, it takes, it takes, hold on. It takes kind of a badass seal person when I ask that question to kind of laugh and say I was on the wrong end of a machine gun. And that's kind of how the job goes. (laughs) Like most people, I mean, most people don't have that reaction. Well, I mean, Hey, we do hard things. I mean, (laughs) you know, that's the name of your podcast. And that really is the essence of the SEAL teams. We do hard things. We do dangerous things. I mean, whether it's in training or combat, the job that we do has a level of risk and you have to accept those risks. Now we do everything we can to minimize those risks. And then life is no different. Um, There's a lot of people who are super risk averse. So they won't, how they avoid risk is they just don't, they don't take risks. Uh, but the problem is without risk, you don't get the reward. So whether it's in business or whether it's in life, whether it's in, you know, adventurous things you do, or in this case, it's being a SEAL, um, there's a tremendous reward that comes with being a SEAL. You get to be a part of an amazing team. You are I mean, it's hard to believe at times that uh, I got paid to do what I did. I mean, you know, people pay a lot of money to do the things that we did. I got paid to jump out of airplanes. I got paid to blow things up. I got to use amazing equipment and technology and and gear and, you know, travel all over the world to some of the most incredible places. Um, But obviously, there is a level of risk that comes with that. You know, jumping out of airplanes can be dangerous if something goes wrong. Um, diving, you know, um, underneath gigantic ships in the dead of the night. Um, if something goes wrong, there is a risk that comes with that. Um, shooting bullets within inches of your buddy's head when you're doing close quarters combat has a level of risk. Uh, and unfortunately, when things go wrong, whether it's training or combat, people can get injured or killed. Uh, combat obviously gets more complex because, you have one outlier that you can't control, and that is the enemy. And we have a saying in the SEAL teams, when you go into combat, the enemy always has a boat. So no matter what plan you make, the enemy has a boat. And you don't necessarily know what his boat is going to be. Um, you can plan based on what you've seen, no different than in life and in business. We do projections, we base things off past experiences, and then we build our plan around that. Well, combat is no different. And the night that I got wounded, um, <clears throat> we had a um, we had a scenario unfold. We took down one target, and nothing happened on the first target we took down. Um, but we saw a lot of activity on another house about 150 yards away, and we saw some individuals run out from that house, um, which frequently can happen if they're trying to evade us. Um, obviously we have some pretty good technology. So we saw them come out of this house. We saw them run and hide. Well, I took my team and we maneuvered on these individuals. Um, and they had a boat (laughs) and their boat was, Hey, we're going to set up an ambush line ahead of time. Um, which we did not know. These were the factors we did not know that the individuals we saw come out of that house were the last part of this ambush line and the last part of a very large, well-trained security detail for the number one uh, Al-Qaeda leader we were going after. 
And when we saw these, you know, four or five individuals come out of this house, we just thought, oh, well, they're just running and hiding in this vegetation. But what we didn't know is they had built a very well-established ambush line and they were last part of this large ambush formation. And we walked right into their ambush. And uh, that's how I found myself (laughs) and my teammates uh, on the wrong end of actually not just one, but two machine guns and multiple AK-47 shooters uh, without really any cover, uh, cover being something that will stop bullets. Yeah. So brick wall, concrete wall. Um, the only cover we ended up having back behind me was a large John Deere style tractor tire. And uh, my teammates fell back to that. There was also one tree uh, that one of our guys was behind. And uh, and that is how this gunfight played out. Uh, I was out front at first and just got stitched across the body, uh, took rounds in the body armor. I took two uh, rounds in the left elbow, so totally destroyed my my elbow, which I, I didn't know it at the time. I actually thought my arm had been shot off, but thankfully it was still attached. Um. And then, uh, you know, I was in a pretty bad situation. I was taking a lot of gunfire. I took rounds, uh, like I said, body armor, uh, took rounds off my helmet, rounds off my gun, uh, rounds off my right side plate. And then I turned to try and move back. And that's when I caught a round in the face. It caught me right in front of the ear, traveled through my face, exited the right side of my nose, blew out my right cheekbone, which broke and kicked out to the right. The bullet traveled right under my eye. It vaporized the orbital floor, broke all the bones above the eye, shattered the head of my jaw, shattered my jaw to my chin and and knocked me out. So when it hit me, the guys saw me fall and they thought I was dead. But it's it's not enough. You then have to lie there waiting to be recovered for a long time. Yeah, we estimate the firefight was about 40 minutes. I was shot in the face probably in the first five minutes of the firefight. Um, we don't know how long I was unconscious, probably five to 10 minutes. So so probably a period of anywhere from you know 25 to 30 minutes of laying there, um, bleeding out and um, waiting very patiently because <laughs> uh, what else are you going to do uh, for my teammates to, to, you know, win the fight. And, um, you know, during moles and fire, my team leader came forward and got me saved by life, got a tourniquet on my arm and then um, uh, packed some of my facial wound and got us ready, um, you know, continued to direct the firefight. Guys were continuing to shoot. We ended up calling in what's called a fire mission. So meaning we have an aircraft overhead that fires rounds down onto the ground. A lot of people are familiar. It's called an AC-130 gunship and uh, probably one of the most amazing platforms for saving the lives of guys on the ground. Our fire mission that night was the closest fire mission in the entire Iraq war. So we literally called rounds in directly on our position. And um, and that was um, an interesting, uh, amazing thing, to be perfectly honest. I mean, we'd called in a lot of fire uh, throughout my career. I had done it. Uh, but to hear my team leader yell incoming and to actually the, the gun and the aircraft is up at a certain altitude. I won't say where they're at. But there is a delay from the time the gun goes off of multiple seconds, uh, up to five seconds even, where you hear the gun go off, boom, boom, boom. And then like you're counting. It's almost like watching lightning strike and then you're waiting for the crack of thunder. Um, Same thing. You hear the gun go off and you're waiting for the rounds to impact the ground. Um, and I remember hearing the gun go off and waiting and all of a sudden the ground erupt in front of us and the explosion go up over us. And uh, that actually took the machine gun out, which enabled us to ultimately call in more fire missions and uh, and get out of there. Get out of there. We're going to break down part of, of your new book, uh, Overcome. And, and the reason for that is because what we're speaking about right now, this, this ambush, you have been able to create what for me 
is an amazing illustration of the way life sometimes has a way of kicking us and surprising us. And what you have done and been trained and have been able to work through in the military in terms of getting out of an ambush can be applied to life. But before we move on to that, I just have to to sit here for a moment and just imagine, and, and you write about this even in the book, but the 35 minutes that you're laying there shot watching, you know, hearing bullets zing by, waiting for people to help you as all hell is breaking loose and you're just laying there waiting to die. Um, I mean, what a, what does one think about in that moment? Uh, I went through a series of thought processes. One, I initially was focused on the job. Um, so that, you know, credit to our level of training and I guess my mindset. So my my initial thought patterns were, this is a bad situation. What do we have to bring to bear to the problem? And, you know, I thought about my teammates, uh, obviously behind me. I thought about teammates that were back at the original house that we had taken down. Um, we had Marines that were on standby as a quick reaction force. We had uh, helicopters, Navy helicopters pushed off on standby. We had drones, we had a medevac helicopter, which obviously was very important for me. Uh, and we had the AC-130 gunship. So I remember rolling through all that in my mind. As I lost more blood, I think I started to realize like, hey, man, you are dying. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I think at the beginning, I was kind of angry. Um, I was angry that one, I had allowed myself to get in this situation. Like, I was like, why didn't I... Why did I see this better? Um, which I think is very common in any major crisis or emergency situation we get into. Uh, after the fact, we tend to second guess ourselves. Why didn't I see this? Eh, sometimes there are signs and sometimes there are not. Um, but I was kind of angry that I had allowed myself to get in this situation. I was angry at the thought that the enemy would have had a great victory uh, to kill a SEAL or a special. We had been a the SEALs were definitely very feared by the enemy, uh, and for them to kill one of us is a big victory for them. Uh, so that kind of made me angry, and I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to give them that victory. Um, and then I, I also, you know, started to think about like, hey, man, this is where you may go out. And and I think the reality that, that set in, I started to think about my wife and my kids and that, you know, I probably wasn't going to see them again. And that's a sad moment. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of people about this. Like, are you ready to die today? Um, most of us are not. Most of us live our lives thinking that we have more time. And we're not prepared. Um, you know, did, did you leave an argument with your uh, spouse or your kid or someone you love hanging out there? And thought, oh, well, I'll just go back and take care of this later. Or, you know what? I'm going to let them stew because I'm angry right now. We well, never know when your day's coming, man. And, um, and I'll be honest, I also wasn't quite ready. Um, I, there are a lot of things I would have done differently up to that point in my life. And I'll tell you what, as a guy who was laying there facing death, and, and it's the one, one guarantee in this life, we're all going to die. Um, so it's something you need to come to grips with. Are you ready to go? Because you don't know when that day is coming. And hopefully you live your life where you have no regrets, where when you get to that moment, you say, you know what, man, I told everybody I loved, I loved them. I did all those things that I wanted to do. Um, I've done my best that I can because there is no perfection. You know, we're always going to have a little bit of regrets, but that you went out there and you did it. And when you check out, hopefully you can say, hey, I did it right. I'm, I'm ready to go. Have you found yourself since 2007 backsliding in certain ways? And do you use that moment as a refresher or is it something where you're so on top of it you, that you won't even allow yourself to backslide? No, man, I'm human. I backslide. Everybody <laughs> backslides. You know. I, mean, I was just admitting to you off camera. I was like, I've been binging like crazy this week on my diet. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, there are some coaches out there that present themselves as perfect. Um, I don't buy it. You know, maybe they are, but I don't buy it. Uh, human nature just is not that way. I mean, maybe you're maybe even these guys that show themselves at perfect operate at a 98 percent level, which I'm going to tell you is 
literally 0.000000001% of the population on this planet. Because we're human. We have problems. We have um, complexities. We are not robots. Yeah. Um, so these coaches that are out there that I know some other people follow and they're like, perfection is the only answer, you know, extremism at all times is the only answer. If you want to be great, that's bullshit. Um, the reality is, man, we are all human, including me. And I have moments where I fall back and I get off course. The difference between highly successful people is they get back on course and people who are not successful, they allow these moments to get them off course. And then they just go, well, fuck it. I'm off course. So it doesn't matter anymore. So I'm just going to stop trying. If I was, you know, maybe I was working out and following this diet and this last two weeks, I totally got off course and I ended up gaining three pounds back. So I'm just throwing my whole program out the window and I'm just going to gorge on ice cream and not go to the gym ever again. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> That's a terrible plan. What's wrong with you? Get your ass back on course, man. Well, and, so and it happens to me. It this is, to this me is, too. This is the perfect segue actually, because uh, there are things that we can do that we often do to self-sabotage, to, um, to, to hurt ourselves, to hold ourselves back. We don't believe it. We don't do it. We're not, we don't stay committed. Like that's all on us. But, but what I, what I absolutely, what I, I don't want to even say love this, this blew my mind. Like the concept of a life ambush, which is the perfect way to describe when it's not you letting yourself down. It's not you letting things slide. It's life comes along and hits you with something you did not expect. You know, in your business, there's regulatory changes and suddenly you, you know, you, you're going bankrupt or uh, the, the bank comes in and, and pulls all the loans or you find out that your significant other wants to leave you or there's a medical diagnosis that comes along that, that you were not prepared for. And of course, we could all go big picture and say, we're in control of everything and this and that. But sometimes life just usually in twos and threes kicks you when you're down. So can you help now that we've kind of gone through the idea of, of the fact that that military ambushes can really mess you up? What is this life ambush thing? Help, help me walk through this. So I'm sure there's a lot of you listening to this that listen to the story of that, you know, this devastating machine gun ambush. And you're like, holy shit, man, I can't relate to that. And, you know, the, I like to tell people you actually can't. Um, and here's the reasons why I, you know, obviously, thank you. Thanks to my teammates and the Air Force AC-130 gunship that saved our lives, survived a pretty vicious enemy ambush. And, and you heard about the bullets and bombs that we encountered on the battlefield. But the reality is when you encounter a life ambush, you're being hit by the bullets and bombs of life. So, Mark, everything you talked about up there, the, the, the major crisis in your business, uh, you've suddenly been diagnosed with a major disease, you lose a loved one, sexual trauma, any of these things, you're being hit by the bullets and bombs of life. So it's not you're not you know, it's not like you're literally being shot or blown up, but your life and everything that goes on it. In, on in it is being shot and blown up. And the interesting thing is, if I was to hook you up to all these medical devices that measured heart rate and respirations and brainwave activity and all these different things, and, and I was also hooked up to that during my firefight, uh, we would look almost identical in a major crisis because the human body doesn't have a oh my God, firefight level. It just has fight or flight. It just has, let me inject cortisol and stress and uh, you know all these different chemicals into your body because we are in a major crisis. So if you understand that, then re the reality is how do we deal with these things when they come? And also accepting the fact that they are coming. That's one of the big things I talk about with life ambushes. Um, and, and let me take one more step back. There are levels of life ambushes. And I think this is another really important thing to talk about. You know, if you look at what happened in my gunfighter, if you look at some of the things that you talked about, ma major sickness or something like that, I, I call those major life ambushes. Those are those are the big ones. And these are the ones that will forever leave um, physical. You know, I, I, I got all these physical scars that will never go away. Uh, physical, mental. So we have the mental trauma that comes with significant bad events, emotional 
or deep financial scars. And usually it's a combination of multiple that come together to make major life ambushes. Um, they, those scars never heal. Um, right now, those of you that are listening, you can probably think back to a moment that occurred in your life. It could be childhood trauma. It could be sexual trauma. It could be a divorce. It could be the loss of a loved one. Some of the highest ones I've ever seen are the loss of a child. Uh, that pain will always be with you. You will always feel it. You will think back and it just, it hurts um, because they're majors, they're majors. And you will always think back on them. So those are the majors. The good news with majors is the average person will only encounter five on average. Now I know people that have encountered <laughs> good 10. news, good news in your lifetime. On average, you're only going to have five times that life tries to kick the shit out of you. Yes. Majors, the majors. And uh, still a lot, man. it is. And then they are painful. They are painful. Um, but if you have a mindset of readiness, what I call the overcome mindset, uh, and, and what I talk about in overcome, how do we balance? How do we lead ourselves? Then you're better prepared for them when they come. If you live a life that, oh, that'll never happen to me, you're in trouble because when they come, it will rock your world. The second level is a, a lesser level of life ambush. It's what I call a schedule disruption. And it's something that comes along. It is a major. Um, I'll be honest, COVID for a lot of people had different impacts. For some people, it was just a scheduled disruption. For others, it actually turned into a major life ambush because they saw the loss of their business or sickness or the loss of a loved one. So COVID kind of operated in two levels. Um, but for the most part, uh, a scheduled disruption is something just occurs that knocks you off your schedule. Um, what I see, though, is a lot of people have these things happen and they allow it to impact them for much longer than it should, uh, because you allow it to negatively impact you. You allow it to negatively impact your work, your the people around you. Um, it becomes an excuse not to get things done. And then the, the last one of, of life ambush, I call it a micro ambush. And, and I'll be honest, they're actually the most dangerous. I've seen more people die from a micro ambush. Um, not, not physically die, but mentally and emotionally die from a micro ambush. It is the, it is that little voice in your head that tells you, you are not good enough. You are not fast enough. You're not a good enough leader. You'll never be able to do this. You're the wrong race, creed, color, gender, gender persuasion, whatever it is, that voice that tells you you're a victim, uh, that you'll never be a victor. Why bother getting up? Why bother losing that weight? Why bother starting that business? You want to have you want to have money? You came from a poor family. You don't deserve money. Those are micro ambushes. Those are ambushes of the mind. And I watch more people lay down on the X, and we're going to talk about what the X is, and die mentally, yeah. emotionally, and financially um, because they buy into that lie. You know, in, in about a month ago, I was uh, I was preparing for an event that I was hosting and speaking at down in Florida, and uh, I found myself one morning, a Sunday morning, I was gonna go down to the uh, to the hotel gym and go for uh, a run, and I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> right? Like it's the winter time. I live in the Northeast. Um, why not <laughs> go out for a run in Florida? So I'm out for this run, and as I'm as I'm out there, and I'm thinking about the days ahead, and I'm thinking about the weeks ahead. For some reason, this thing pops into my head where I realize that that my ambition is my greatest asset that I've ever had, and yet, at somewhere along the way. I was told or it was impressed upon me that ambi ambition is a bad thing, that, that it makes you, you know, like way too direct or way too confrontational, or too competitive, or all you care about is money or you're greedy or all of these things. And, and I was thinking back and I had this moment and it stuck with me so, so innately because I had this moment where I realized my wife, who we've been together for 23 years, when we met, she was she was interested in me because of my ambition. Um, my team follows me because of my ambition. Every time that I hit the next level is because I'm ambitious. Why somehow in my mind am I spending time downplaying this very thing that is actually my greatest asset that I could be leveraging? And I don't. The, the thing that scares me the most is is this could have been holding me back for the last 10, 15, 20 years and me not even realize it. And so it's like, oh man, you know. I'm not right now. I am not dealing with one of those major life, you know, ambushes yet. They they may be coming. Yes, you know, we've had some delays. COVID hit us and this and that. But we're they are coming. <laughs> they are. 
You don't like that I said they may come? That was too much of a That's hedge. right. <laughs> don't tell yourself that, people. They are coming. Okay. They, they are coming. But but the, you're right. These little micro ambushes are the ones that, that, that secretly are robbing us of who we could be. And so, you know, there, there are these different versions of people who kind of get stuck. We get stuck because the ambush comes and we just think that that's it. We give up or, or we get stuck because we wear the victim mentality. We put it on and we can, and we can say like, well, this happened to me. You don't understand. This is me and this is me and it's out of my control and I can play the victim. Or you, you kind of describe this rare group who somehow use this thing that's happened to you to like propel you to a, a stronger, better version of you. How, how does that happen? How have you seen that happen in all your coaching and all the people that you've worked with through this? You know, it, it becomes a launch point. And, and it's really when the mindset changes from being a victim. Like, you may not know this, but there is a pandemic in this country. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of it. You know, this major pandemic over the last several years. Um, I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about the victim mindset. There are more and more people that are buying into this idea that I'm a victim. Um, and I think it's being perpetuated by social media, by the media, uh, even even political leaders are, are leveraging this and saying you're a victim and that you can't get ahead unless someone helps you. And that's such a lie. Um, man, you live right now. You know, we are in America, uh, one of the greatest countries in the world. And, and there's this I won't even go down this other narrative that tries to say that America is a bad place. I won't even go into any of that. Focus on the fact that within this country, you have two critical things, freedom and opportunity. You have the freedom. Nobody forces you to do anything in this country. You really don't within the constraints of the law. We'll, we'll say that. So if you live in Michigan, nothing stops you from going to another state. You know, we live in one of the greatest countries. You have the ability to go where you want to go and opportunity. We, we live in the greatest time and day in the world. Technology has enabled us to do things that people have not, you know, just weren't able to do. We live in this incredible gig economy where literally a 16 year old kid or younger can start their own business right from this phone and make money like we can collect money everywhere we go. So you have this freedom and opportunity, which amazes me because so many people want to be convinced they're a victim. I'm a victim because, you know, I'm too small or I'm a victim because I'm too big or I'm a victim because I'm a, a woman or I'm a victim because I'm a specific color or, or race. I don't care, whatever it is. So. People launch from life ambushes when they realize they're no longer a victim. I, in my book, The Trident, it is all about how I made some mistakes as a young leader. I failed as a young leader and I almost got myself kicked out of the SEAL teams. And I saw myself as a victim. I saw myself being thrown under the bus. And the reality is when I finally kind of grew up and woke up and realized, hey man, you're the problem. Like you're the problem. Here's the good news. You're also the solution. Yeah. And that is the turning point when you stop saying I'm a victim and you say, well, I'm, I'm going to be a victim. And, and I talked about the X. The X is the point of attack. It's the point of the crisis. It's the sticking point that everybody gets into. So in an ambush, the X is the point of attack. In a, a mental or a micro ambush, it's that point in your mind that's telling you you can't do this. And it's the methodology the is goal in an ambush to keep you pinned down there, right? Because if you have options, if you can move, if 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 you if you're not confused, if if you know what's happening, you can regain control. But if they can keep you just like stuck overwhelmed there and overwhelm you, then then there's nothing you can do, right? It's very difficult. I mean, it takes a lot of effort to fight back from a very well executed ambush, but it's no different. Make, you know, think about our minds. How often do our minds pin us down? How often do our minds overwhelm us with negative information? You know, I, the human mind is the most dangerous battlefield you'll ever be on. And uh, it will kill you, literally. Um, you know, it is incredible. So understanding this idea of getting off the X in a in a in actual battlefield ambush, we talk about you have to get off the X as quickly as possible. You have to get out of 
that that kill zone, as we call it in an ambush. This is where the enemy's got all their weapons and firepower trained. When you start moving off that X, it becomes more difficult. Now the enemy's got to move. You know, they're 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 set up to try and pin you on that X. So you have to have a mindset of getting off the X. One of the biggest things that I talk about in, in the book, Overcome, <laughs> you always have to have a mindset to get off the X. I mean, Mark, you know, you talked about, you know, maybe one's coming in the future. They are coming. I got bad news. Um, I tell people you're either, there's three groups of people. You're either, uh, you're either coming out of a life ambush, you're recovering from a life ambush, you're in a major life ambush, or there's one out there on the horizon waiting for you. Um, uh, I'm going to be just, really honest with you. This is um, this is partially, I think, I don't know if it's fixed mindset or scarcity mindset or just fear or worry, what have you. But you know, my wife and I, we we have four kids, healthy, beautiful, amazing kids, and they're older now. You know, our oldest is 15, our youngest is eight. But but we both remember when we were expecting our third. We were just waiting for something to go wrong. Like we have two beautiful kids and they're healthy and they're happy. And then and then our third is born, healthy, happy. We're expecting our fourth. We're just, we're just waiting. <laughs> we just we just know something. Like how how can we be so lucky to have four kids? We have four kids and they're perfectly and then as they're growing up, we're just like, oh, they're gonna get hurt or they're gonna, something and and nothing, nothing has happened. And so it's like part of why I I I I hedge so much is because deep down inside, I know stuff is going to happen. But that almost scares me. It almost like I'm so future focused that I so know something's going to happen. I'm like, I'm waiting for, for, for the shoe to drop. And that's, that's no way to live either though, right? It, it is not. And um, I often talk about, you know, you've got to be a point man for your own life. So point men are the, the guys who lead us to our targets. And um, amazing, they're, they're incredible at, at, at reconnaissance, they're incredible at navigation, and they have tremendous awareness skills of the world around them. And you really got to live your life that way. Um, so many of us live our lives, just, I mean, especially in this day and age, I mean, just watch people, we live our lives in, in this thing right here. Um, having your head on a swivel and understanding, you know, both from a physical perspective landscape perspective of there are threats out there and bad people to all aspects of your life, professionally, physically, personally, always watching because there are life ambushes out there. But oftentimes I talk about indicators. There are indicators that something is on the horizon. So you can't live your life in total fear. I mean, that's no way to live, although a lot of people live that way because you can't control the uncontrollable. I mean, why waste all this time trying to control things? I mean, there's so many people that are losing their minds over Ukraine or the you know, supply chain issues or the you know, high gas prices, whatever it is. You have no control over those things. Why are you stressing about them? Focus on what you can control and then just watch. Are there any indicators that any of these things are creating a negative impact or potentially could create a, a larger impact in my life? Um, that's what good point men do. They're watching for potential ambushes. So we're watching for signs or indicators. Case in point, if you go to the doctor for a physical and the doctor says, Mark, hey, man, I want to talk to you about your health. Uh, hey, man, your cholesterol is off the roof. You haven't been working out. Your blood pressure's through the roof. We need to make some changes. And you're like, OK, Doc, roger that. And then you leave and you're like, ah, I'm busy. I don't have time to make changes. You know, I'll, de I'll deal with that later. And then eight, yeah. nine months I, from now, it's, a year it's from funny. Now, two years from now, you have when a the heart, heart attack, attack happens or the stroke happens. I, I, I ignored the indicator. I see what you're saying. Absolutely. And, and it's no different in life. We do it in business. We do it in relationships. I mean, how many times do I know people that are divorced? Um. And, and they tell me before, you know, when they look back on it, how many times did their spouse try and sit them down and talk to them? And they were too yeah. busy. They're too, I don't have time for this right now. Don't worry. We'll deal with this later until finally one day, you know, they get the, the hey, hey, here are the papers. I want a divorce. Oh, I never saw this coming. Well, it's because you were not a good point, man. And you were ignoring the indicators. That is that brings me so much relief. <laughs> I love, you know, I heard this quote a, a few weeks ago that I loved as well, which is like, I think a lot of us, we just put our head in the sands 
And yes. uh, they say, you know, when you put your head in the sand, where is your, where's your backside? <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's up in the air waiting to get kicked. So, so we can't ignore these things. So you just helped me out so much, man. Thank you. So if, if we're, if we're in a life ambush or if we need to prepare for it, because we can prepare, it will happen to us. We know that this ambush is trying to keep us on the X that it's trying to keep us stuck. How do we develop this overcome mindset? How do we get off the X? How do we move past it? So we're not a victim of this, but we can we can be that rare breed of person who actually uses it as a launching point to become a better person. So an overcome mindset is built on two things. Um, preparation. So this is a little bit of, you know, what are the things that we do in our lives to prepare? Um, I talk about five different levels as a, as a leader, the Pentagon of peak performance. So physical leadership is one level of preparation. So how do you take care of your body? Nutrition, sleep is a very important thing that is often overlooked, especially here in America. Um, mental leadership, what are you doing to educate yourself? What are you doing to learn more about all aspects of life? Mentors, what are you doing to get out of your comfort zone? If you live in your comfort zone all the time, when something bad happens and you get uncomfortable, it's really hard to deal with. Whereas if periodically you do things to make yourself uncomfortable, to scare you, to, to deal with discomfort and a little bit of pain, then it makes it easier to deal with those things when they come. Emotional leadership. How do you manage your emotions? Do you control your emotions or, or do your emotions run your life? Um, social leadership. How do you invest in the rings of influence of people around you? And then spiritual leadership. Uh, for some, that's religion and faith. Plays a part for me. Uh, for others, it's just perspective and getting outside of yourself. That, that is your preparation in, in having this balance. And, and that is kind of the base level of the overcome mindset. The second part is action when things happen. So uh, it is built on this idea of, hey, bad things could happen. And I think I oftentimes, you know, one of the things the SEAL teams taught me was, hey, hope for the best, but prepare and plan for the worst. And one of the things we were really good um, I was a training instructor for a period of time. We came up with the most sadistic things we could ever think of that could potentially happen on the battlefield. And the reality was, oftentimes, we did a really good job. But frequently, the real world never unfolds. You, you just can't wrap your head around how sometimes things are going to unfold. So it's in those moments that it's a combination of the preparation and a combination of the overcome mindset to get off the X in those, those situations. And by thinking about, you know, you gave the, the scenario of you guys were afraid that, that something would be wrong with your child. Um, I don't think that's totally unhealthy. There may be some people that would say, oh my God, that's such a negative mindset. You're like jinxing your family. I don't buy that. Uh, personally, I, I think there's a level of preparation. Like, well, what would happen if my child was born with some sort of uh, disability or disorder? Um, what would happen if suddenly my business imploded? What would happen if I lost my spouse? I mean, these are dark thought patterns, but I don't know. It's part of how I was trained. I don't dwell on those things. I don't start going down the road of, oh, my God, you know, what if I lost my spouse? Um, but I do think about if that occurred how would I handle it? What would I do? Have I put things in place to, to manage that, you know, do life insurance policies and I have insurance to take care of my wife and medical insurance and all these different things. Um, so that's your preparation. And then now we get into the action when something Bef bad happens. Before we get into the action, let me ask you this question because the thought just struck me. I think that, that people do not practice things enough. You know, like like part of being a bit of a fixed mindset, which I think most people are stuck in. So the fixed mindset is, you know, if I'm good, that means I'm good. And if I'm bad, that means I'm bad. Whereas a growth mindset is, you know, hey, I screwed this up. I guess I can learn. Hey, I didn't do as well as I thought I could do. I guess I can learn. I can always get better. I was the king or, or the mayor of fixed mindset town. And so a lot of people, I think, don't practice as much as they should because they just want to show up and be great at it. They just like, why, why waste energy practicing or preparing or planning when I, I, I'm going to be awesome at this or I'm going to suck at it. And they just want to kind of one and done stuff. Is that something that you've noticed or seen as well? 
Absolutely. Because people don't want to, we want to do the things that we're really good at, but guess what? You don't really get any better when you continue to do the things you're really good at. The reason I say this is I've spoken to a lot of Navy SEALs and, uh, and every time I do, they go, well, you know, it, when you're doing your prep meetings and I'm thinking, uh, I don't really do that with my team. And they're like, oh, you know, when you're, when you're doing your debrief and you're sitting down and you're working, I'm like, oh gosh, I don't, I don't do that either. I don't, I don't do the planning meetings. I don't communicate effectively. I don't do this. I don't plan up backup scenarios. And I'm just, and I'm thinking like, oh gosh. And you know, if, I, if I'm representative of one, there's lots of us out there who are just winging it as we go. And so, so what you're talking about with preparation is, is a foundational part of this. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it is, it, it's from mission planning that, you know, we are looking at a mission, whether it's a training mission or whether it's a real world mission and we're playing out. Well, how is this going to unfold? Here's our plan. But what happens if the plan suddenly goes sideways at all different aspects of it? What happens if suddenly we start getting shot at when we're walking to the target? OK, what happens if suddenly we start getting shot at as we make entry? What happens if, um, you know, this house over here to the right suddenly opens up on us as we're moving up? You know, we try and talk through those things. And then like case in point, like you talked about the after action debrief, we, we talk about how did it go? Uh, and we talk about, you know, the things that went well, and we talk about the things that didn't go well. And if somebody screwed up, you get called out for screwing up. For the most part, you know, when you screw up, it is not, um, this is something I've come to learn as I get, old, I get older. Most people, 95% of the time, most people are not, um, they don't intentionally screw up. They don't say, well, I'm going to screw this up. I'm going to steal or something like that. I mean, that's a little more egregious. But, you know, most of the time when something gets off course within your business, your team, they just, they got careless, but they might add something going on. I mean, maybe they were having a life ambush at home because their kid got sick or something happened that allowed them to get careless that created this domino effect. And I think as leaders, it's important to, you know, respect them that you lead people, you don't lead machines. And this is where the after action and these debriefs come into play. Hey, we had a screw up. This went wrong. Well, how do we prevent it from the future? Well, Mark, man, what happened, dude? You were supposed to you know, submit this report that, you know, check the box for us to be able to do X, Y, and Z. What happened? Oh, man, I'm so sorry. I just, I didn't, it didn't get done, which led to a failure point. And then we start, you know, on, on, you know, peeling that onion back and we come to find out that you had some major things going on in your life. This could be an opportunity for your company or team to say, okay, how do we put safeguards in place to make sure this doesn't happen again? And not only that, bigger than that, let's go further downstream. How do we put safeguards in place so that if we have somebody that's having some major life ambush problems, maybe we pull them out of the team for a little while so that they can go heal and take care of themselves and, and and it doesn't create a negative impact on the team. We have some redundancies. And I think the SEAL teams um, have gotten pretty good at that, um, which is tough because sometimes we're beginning to recognize we're not uh, we're not supermen, um, you know, war and a constant high speed pace uh, can harm the mind. And that's a real tough thing for people to admit, but we're beginning to recognize we need, we need to make sure that everybody's healthy, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally at all times. Same should go in your business and how you look at how you're doing all these things. Jason, I, I, I love what you're sharing, actually, because I think, I think we can look at the, the coaches, the authors, the SEALs that have been put out, these really tough guys as as these machines, these things that, as you said, like, like we are people, we have our ups, we have our downs. We can't be on all the time, constant pace. That, that helps me a little bit just because it, it helps put into perspective, uh, what, what, you know, I'm working towards and what level I can actually hit and what is sustainable and what is actually achievable. Sometimes when you're only seeing the outside stuff, especially on Instagram or other things, it, it sets this bar that's just unachievable. And we've seen this, uh, you know, with young girls, we've seen this with, with, uh, even with, with guys in terms of how they want to physically look or, or diet or business or finance or whatever it is. So I, I love that. Now, so you said preparation is the first part. Action is the second part. If a life ambush is pinning us on the X, how the hell do we put this behind us? Yeah. So to get off the X, you have to react. It's a pretty easy acronym. And it's pretty easy to remember, you know, it's not like uh, to get off the X, we have to, you know, Apple TV. 
you know, we have to react, which makes sense. Human behavior, we must react when we get a negative stimulus. And, and react is just an acronym on what you have to do. Uh, the, the R stands for you got to recognize your reality. And Mark, you nailed it. You talked about it's human nature that we want to put our heads in the sand. And we want to do it even more when there is a crisis on the horizon. Because I don't know why, it's just human nature. When we get overwhelmed and stress is piling up and suddenly it's like, oh, my God, um, you know, we're, we're, we're watching a, a train come at us. And instead of getting off the track, we just st- we stand there looking at the light, get closer and closer, yeah. uh, waiting okay. for this impending doom. I'm going to be honest with you. Like we do hard things. A lot of people uh, assume that that means different things to different people. I think facing the truth and accepting the truth is one of the hardest things that we can actually do in our life. So the idea of recognizing your reality is we just, we don't want to do it. We, you know, we would much rather ignore things or live in fairyland or hope and dream it'll all work out than just face reality. Yeah. And it, it's so true. Uh, yeah. Hope that this will not occur or this bad thing that is piling up and looks like, you know, this train's getting ready to hit you or this building's getting ready to fall, whatever it is. Um, 95% of the times it will. Uh, this idea of, I hope it'll just go away. Let me stick my head in the sand and ignore it. Normally that's when it blows up even worse. And, and even and leaders of companies or families, unfortunately, sometimes are some of the worst because they don't want to communicate to their team or their spouse or their kids that there's a major crisis on the horizon. Um, because I don't know, the ego, whatever it is. So recognizing your reality, to be able to quickly, as quickly as possible, say, Houston, we've got a problem. That is one of the first action steps you can take. It is the most critical, most important, and the faster you can come to grips with it, the faster you'll get out the X. And hopefully, the more you can minimize the impact of that ambush. Um, Number two is evaluate your assets. So Oftentimes, when we're in a major life ambush, there are these massive negative feelings we feel. There's no hope. There's nothing I can do. It's all outside of my control. It's not fair. You know, we have all these negative thought patterns. Usually, those are because we believe those things. But once we start to um, understand that we have tools to bring to bear to this problem, it changes the dynamic. Um, I mean, if you look at my gunfight scenario, um, that night, I mean, here I am, I'm pinned down, I'm shot up, I'm bleeding out. Um, it was easy to, to think those things. There's no, there's no hope. There's nothing I can do. It's all outside my control. You know, this isn't fair, whatever. Um, but once I, you know, took that breath and said, okay, this is a bad situation, calm in the chaos. What do we have to bring to bear? Uh, to this problem. Well, my teammates are behind me. I got my other teammates in this house. I got a Marine Corps quick reaction force. I got drones. I got a uh, Army Special Operations medevac helicopter. I got this Air Force AC-130. These were all tools that we had to bring to bear. And and life is no different. Um, You know, if your spouse suddenly presents you with divorce papers, uh, my first thoughts would be, okay, we need a counselor. We need a priest. We need a chaplain. We need a um, maybe I need an attorney, whatever they are. Um, they are, these are the tools that we have to bring to bear to the problem. And, and so that that's number two, that, you know, we evaluate our assets. Number three is assess possible options and outcomes. And there's an interesting thing that happens. Step one normally takes the longest recognizing our reality. Step two, um, evaluate your assets usually takes a little while, Uh, But when we get to step three and it's like, uh, you know, assess options and outcomes, it's like suddenly we have a tool and we're like, yes, let me get out of this terrible situation because it sucks. And I have this tool and and I'm going to rush out to fix it with this tool right now. And and the thing is, this is where um, we need to take a pause. Uh, I really encourage people to. In the military, we call it a tactical pause. And the reason being is in the middle of a crisis, oftentimes we don't know fully how a crisis unfolds. There may be parts of it that you haven't seen the domino effect that's occurred. So this is where we want to pull our team together 
you know, if it's a personal crisis, pull your friends, pull your family, pull your kids. If it's a business crisis, pull your um, pull your team members, pull your employees, pull your staff, pull your board, whoever it is, your advisors, your consultants, bring them all together. And hey, these are the tools we have. What are the best options and outcomes? Um, because frequently what will happen is when we get in a rush, we're like, oh, I have this flathead screwdriver and I'm going to rush out and fix this problem with this flathead screwdriver. And then you rush out there, you know, and realize, holy shit, it's a it's a Phillips. It's not a flathead. I just wasted all this time. So this is where it's important to bring our team together to evaluate the tools we have and decide, OK, what's the best option and outcome? Um, number four. Choose a direction and communicate it. You are never on the X all by yourself. The X has its own gravitational pull. And um, if, like I said, if it's a personal ambush, your wife, your kids, your friends are on the X with you. If it's a professional ambush, uh, your, your, your staff, your business leaders, your board, uh, your investors, believe it or not, even your clients get pulled on the X with you, depending on the level of the ambush. So, this is why it's critical to choose a direction and communicate it. In a crisis, chaos reigns. You know, we're trying to sort through the, the bullets and bombs of life and figure out where we go. Other people on the X are feeling that same thing. Once we've gone through options and outcomes, choose the one that you're going to use and then communicate it to your team. There's a natural tendency as leaders. It's in our head. And then we start second guessing ourselves and then we start ruminating about the decision. And then we, you know, we go down this path and we waste a lot of time. Choose the direction. You had your team. You figured out, hey, this tool we're going to use is going to be best. It's going to enable this outcome. Communicate it to your team. That's going to accomplish several things. Number one, once you communicate it, it gives you a very clear direction for yourself to follow. Number two, it gives a clear direction for your people and the others on the X to follow. Number three, it gives hope. People want to hear there's a plan, man. They're like, yeah. oh my God, there's a crisis. Oh, yeah, wait. I, I was going to say like, like what, I, what I love about this process, I, I'm a huge fan of frameworks. I'm a huge fan of processes. But just even if we were to move through these steps, when you're on the X in the life ambush and you're starting this, you have nothing. Like you have... You, you're, you're freaking out. You're overwhelmed. You feel like, like there is nothing. And by the end of moving through these steps, you have something. And something is better than nothing. Something gives you hope. Even if it's kind of the wrong direction, you can kind of course correct or change or you can learn things or whatever. But, but doing something is, is so much more hopeful than nothing at all, right? And, and most people will do the latter. They will do nothing. They will sit there. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll hit that point in one second, what tends to happen. Because, um, yeah, the last step, T, of react, you've got to take action. A lot of people will get to that final step, and then they're waiting for the perfect moment. Hey, we've come up with this plan. We're ready to execute this plan. And now we're waiting for the perfect moment, whether... I don't know. We need to close a deal so we have more cash flow. You know, hey, man, <laughs> you need to go. We need to go now. The faster we move. Um, you've got to take action. And like you said, when we do that, a poor plan violently executed is significantly better than a perfect plan that never happens. Um, and, and when you move, when you take action, it creates momentum and you can use that momentum to keep going. Uh, and that's what's critical. Um, what I've come to find is that the X is like quicksand. It pulls you down. And the longer you sit on it, the harder it is to get up and move. And usually what most people do is they waste so much time at the beginning um, focused on their pain and misery and not doing anything. You know, oh, woe is me. I'm a victim. This is unfair. Um, they, we have a tendency to do three things, human beings, when we're on the X. We look back at what we lost and we you know, I want back that, you know, whatever it was. Um, we look forward at where we should have been if this life ambush had not happened. Or we look directly, we, we look at the pain and misery, and then we look around us and, and human behavior, we look for someone or something to blame. 
And we waste so much time trying to find someone or something to blame when you're on the X in the middle of the crisis. It makes no sense. You know, none of that matters. All that matters is getting off the X and driving forward. Um, you know, if someone or something caused it, you can figure that out later in an after action debrief. But the reality is in the moment, it doesn't matter what caused it or who caused it. All that matters is you're taking bullets and bombs of life, man. You got to get off the X. I love it. So when you're in this life ambush, when you have been in life ambush, and, and in your book, you lay out a few of them. There was issues with the charity you were running uh, back when you spoke about in Trident, how as a leadership role within the SEALs and that that you had kind of a bump in your career. And then when you went to the army Rangers, you kind of carried that forward with you. Um, you had the ambush where I mean, you were shot in the head. I mean, like these, these things have happened to you. I, I am obsessed with questions because I think the questions we pose ourselves leads to the answers that our brain solves. And so when you're in these life ambushes, when you're in these really hard moments, what is the question you pose to yourself or what do you say to yourself to get through them? I think it comes down to who am I? And, and it comes down to what is your mission in this life? Because it's your mission that will, your mission becomes your purpose in the darkest times. In, in, the, in the midst of the storm, that's how you become the light in the darkness. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people in life ambushes come along who think that someone's going to come save them. Um, and, and that probably is not true. I mean, it may be, but I will tell you this, if you are unwilling to get off the X by yourself, I don't care if every single other human being on this planet comes along to save you, you'll just crawl right back onto the X. I've seen it happen again and again. You have to decide I'm going to get off the X. Um, it was, I owe my life to my teammates. I owe my life to the Air Force 130 gunship. I owe my life to the medical team that saved my life. But there was also tremendous willpower, and I believe some intervention from the big man above that enabled me to come home. And, and I had to focus, stay awake to stay alive, because I wanted to get off that X. There were times between the medevac flight and, and when I got to Baghdad and got into emergency surgery, where everything in me said, let go, let go. But I knew if I let go and I went to sleep, I'd never wake up again. So you have to go back to what is, who are you? What do you stand for? Um, I'm real big on your mission statement. So, I mean, it's one of the things that my third book, The Point Man Planner, it's a planner, but it teaches you to write your mission statement. Or frequently I talk about the sign on the door as that became my mission statement. For those who don't know the story about the sign on the door, what was that? So when I was in the hospital, when I first got to the hospital, you know, it was probably only 10 days after I was wounded, I was struggling. Um, you know, for those that don't, you know, we've, we've touched on this leadership failure. That leadership failure is the hardest thing I've ever been through because I got ostracized by members of my own SEAL team. They, they said, kick this guy out, get rid of him. That was a tough blow. Um, and it was a lot of growing up to understand that, hey, I was the problem, but I'm also the solution. But just because I said I'm the solution, I fixed myself didn't mean that there was some switch that got thrown that guys believed in me. Um, so that took several years to build back my credibility and respect with my teammates. By the time I did that, I'm in Iraq, amazing deployment, careers back on track, everything's good. And right at the end, one week before um, coming home, I got wounded. And then I find myself in this hospital bed being told, hey, we're going to amputate your arm, being told you're, you're, you know, you're totally mangled and you're probably never going to operate again. So I, all those feelings that we talked about, no hope, there's nothing I can do outside of my control. It's not fair. All these things were playing out. And on top of that, right about that time, I had some people that came into the room and they were expressing a lot of pity. Uh, I talk about the victim mindset. Well, frequently people, when you have a bad thing happen to you, they will place you into the victim box. Like, hey, we expect you to, to lay there and feel sorry for yourself because you've had this bad thing happen to you. And we're going to give you the thumbs up to do that. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to give you the thumbs up. We're going to expect you to do it. And that's kind of what they did in that room. Um, this big pity party for what had happened to me. And when they left, I was kind of left sitting there with all these emotions and all these thoughts. And I just said, um, no, 
like I just climbed out of the darkest hole I've ever been in, you know, the, the pit of despair that said, hey, you don't you don't belong as a seal. And I had come back and climbed out of this hole. Um, and I just said, I'm not going down that road again. Like I've been down that road. I've been in that hole. I'm going to set the example. You know, the, the I, three rules of leadership, lead yourself, lead others, lead always. And in that moment, in that hospital bed, I said I was going to live it. And I wrote out this sign in that moment. I said, attention to all who enter here. If you're coming in this room with sadness or sorrow, don't bother. The wounds that I received, I got in a job I love, doing it for people that I love, defending the freedom of a country that I deeply love. I will make a full recovery. What is full? That's the absolute utmost physically. I have the ability to recover. Now I'm going to push that about 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you are not prepared for that, go elsewhere. And we signed it, uh, the management. That sign has gone on and went viral, went all over the place. It earned me an invitation to meet President Bush in the White House. It has been written about in multiple books by high-level leaders. Uh, uh, Secretary Gates, First Lady Michelle Obama wrote about it not once, but twice in her book. It's been in documentaries, all these different things. But I, I don't tell people that to say, hey, look at me, I wrote this sign. I tell you that because that is the power of choice. And that is the power of a mission statement that you can look at and fall back on. Because I will tell you what, four years and 40 surgeries, there were dark days. And I would look at that sign. And that's not the original sign. The original sign hangs in the wounded ward at Walter Reed. Um, I would look at that sign and say, you got to keep going. You got to get off the X. You can't lay here and feel sorry for yourself because that's who you are. That's what you stand for. So that's what I tell people. You know, you should know who you are because in the darkest times, it's what will keep you on course. That will be your compass. It will be your light in the darkness to get off that axe and drive forward.